morning. I'm happy to be with you again. And uh, in the last uh, day or two, I've had the opportunity of meeting several of you at various occasions. And I'm truly, truly happy about that. Uh, I love conversations and uh, being informed about things I don't know about, particularly history of uh, Australia. Uh, and uh, I invite you again today uh, to a high tea from 3.30 to 4.30 on the sixth floor uh, level uh, in the restaurant. And just to continue our conversations. Now, last time, I talked about the importance of apology in international relations. It's a subject that uh, is uh, of great importance to all of us for our survival as a human race. Because questions of how do we deal with each other? How do we live with each other? And people continue to ask. Every walk of life, people continue to ask. Psychologists, biologists, anthropologists, historians, people, ordinary people, women, uh, uh, writers, novelists, filmmakers. Why is it we fight? Is it in our nature? Or is it something that is in our environment? in our social and political environment that makes us fight and uh, kill each other, or sometimes on a grand scale. So today's talk is about something that happened about 100 years ago. And in 19, year 1919, many people think it was the most crucial year in the human history. And I want to tra track uh, for you some of the features of that particular year. There is a book that came out about five years ago by one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto with that title, Year 1919, the year that changed the world. Now, something uh, drastic happened uh, in that. As I said, the question of violence, is it in our genes or is it in our, uh, uh, our uh, circumstances and environment, it keeps being asked again and again. And uh, here, first I want to tell you what happened in that war. It was the most drastic and crucial and, and violent war in the human history until that time. It started in 1914 and went on for five years, and for four years, ended on November 11 in, in, in 1918. And during that time, it seems incredible to, be, uh, to see how many people died, how many people died and how they died. I want to put some figures for you that Russia lost 9.1 million people. Think of it. Russia always in the First World War and the Second World War, in both wars, Russia lost the largest number of people. And then you have France lost about 6 million people, 6.1 million people. And Britain and its empire, it spread all over the, uh, many parts of the world, including India, they lost 3.1 million people. India lost about 173 million, 73,000 people. India contributed about 1.3 million people. And then you have Italy's loss of Italy and Romania and USA lost about 350,000 people. Compared to USA, compared to France, compared to Britain, see the number of USA, much smaller. And I will discuss why and how. And then Canada lost 67,000. And Australia lost 54,000 people. And that time, remember the population of the countries, all these countries, much smaller, much smaller than it is today. So the percentage of people who were, who were uh, killed in the process is huge. And it's not just the people who killed, who were the number of people who were wounded. And those who were then uh, wounded not only physically, but also mentally. What happened to them for the next decade or two or three? So these are huge numbers, colossal number. So we see the total number of people on the allied side, 22 million people died. And then what happened in the central power, the other side? Is of course, they are human beings as well. So what happened to them? So you see here, uh, you, you see here that Germany lost 7.1 7 million, 7 .1 million people. And you have Austria, uh, 7 million people, small country, 7 million people. Uh, Turkey lost about a, a million people. And then Bulgaria, and total people on, that cent on the other side of the war, uh, first 15 million people. Total is estimated 37 million people. Think of it, think of it. That is almost, a, it's the number greater than all the population of Canada today. Think of it. That's two, that all the population of London and, and New York and, and 
and Tokyo, and perhaps three or four other cities, great cities of the world, put together. That number is just staggering. And that's that why so many people ask at that time and continue to ask today, why is it that war continues? And, and it's a good question, because it's, as I said, it impinges on our survival, on our, on our values, on our humanity, and then our human nature itself. So here then, I want to put it in the context of a song that became very popular at that time, because it's often women who talk about these questions. And it was, uh, to put it in a, a slightly older context, people have been fighting a long time. You have Alexander the Great, a young man from Mars, uh, Macedonia, going all the way to India to fight and conquer. And many people say he met some of the Buddhist monks there. And the monks were asking, why do you fight? Hmm? Why do you fight? What is it you want to conquer? And at the same time, about a uh, hundred years earlier or so, there was a one great king in India, Ashoka the Great. He conquered many parts of India. He did not conquer other parts of the world, but he conquered many parts of India. And it is said there is a very uh, a brutal war in a place called Kalinga. And he, there were about 150,000 people died. That's a large number of people at that time. And then he saw all this blood, and he went through a transformation. And he said, no longer war. And he became a Buddhist. And he preached Buddhism, peace, nonviolence. And is considered in Indian history one of the great kings of the, of the country, Ashoka the Great. And so many people, whether it's Alexander the Great or Ashoka the Great, we say, what is the greatness about them? And it's about that time, about 2,300, 2,400 years ago, it was part of the Greek, Greek literature, Greek theater. There was a play written called Lysistrata. In this play, the women said, why is it our men, our young men, men who should be at home, and who should be, who are the life of life of the family, why should they be fighting each other and destroying each other? So they came up with a new strategy. It's a strategy I don't believe has ever been tried again, but it's a strategy only in the play, never in life itself. And the strategy was the women said, all those men who are engaged in war, they will have no pleasure of the flesh at home. This is it. No sex. Uh, so there's a sex strike. And it went on for some time. And the men learned a lesson. It says, better to make love than war. Mm? That's the slogan. It became very popular in the 1960s. But it traces back to about 2,300 years ago. So here, Greece is considered by many in the Western world as the, as the, as the roots of Western civilization are, are located. The whole idea of Plato and Aristotle, the idea of rationality and democracy and thought, they we trace it back to Greece. Now, it's a, it's a place where, of course, these questions were raised in theater. That's the way many things were done. And, but this is, continues to our day. And, if, and uh, one book that came out of the First World War, written by a young man, and he was a German, and he was only 18 when he went into the war. He, the book was called All Quiet on the Western Front. It was also made into a remarkable film called All Quiet on the Western Front. And here is this young man describing with his own, what happened to their own fellow young men in the war and the brutality of it, the stupidity of it, the absurdity of it. And he, and he, and he says he had never seen a, an open wound before he went to the war. And now it's the flash of blood all around it. And so the book became a, a classic. It still is uh, one of the great classics. So many people in literature, in theater, in films, in poetry have written about this, uh, this whole concept, why war? So I'll read you here a song that came about. It's called, uh, it was called 10 million soldiers to the war have gone who, have, who may never return again. Ten million mothers' hearts must break for the ones who died in vain. I heard a mother murmur through her tears, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Who dares to place a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy? Let nations arbitrate their future troubles. It's time to lay the sword and gun away. There will be no war today if mothers all would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Now, it might seem to many 
to many, many of us who think, well, that's not how the wars are fought about. But really, when the voices come from the women, they come from the novelists, they come from the playwrights, they come from the poets, that this is not the right thing to do. Then obviously, our culture begins to take it a slightly different turn. And that is, uh, has been happening in small ways. It hasn't stopped us from fighting, but it has been happening nevertheless. Those voices have been, have been there and been occurring for, on a small way for a long, over a long period of time. Now, uh, here, um, I uh, move on here. So at that time, the First World War, I want to t t tell you a little bit of history of it, because it is uh, without that history, what, who was who side and why was it happening, we will uh, not uh, develop a very good picture of it. So let the history is, what were the empires at that time, in the beginning, in 1913, 1914? And here is the empire, the British Empire, was the biggest empire of the period. Uh, it, it said that, that it's empire on which the sun never set. I mean, whatever part of the world you say, the sun is always, sun is always there. And so it's the greatest empire there ever was. So you have British Empire and French Empire and Austro-Hungarian Empire and Ottoman Empire. Many people don't know very much. The Muslim Empire and its headquarters and its head place in Turkey. And yesterday I mentioned to you about the Armenian genocide, and that was, was part of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And then you have Russian Empire, and then German Empire. And so all these are, empire means really uh, its reach and, and influence on other countries, other than your own. That's what makes an empire. It's not just you are uh, very, very powerful in your own land. No, you have colonies, uh, places you rule and control in other parts. Germany, for instance, uh, its, its, empire, its uh, reach in the Pacific uh, Ocean here, and then you have uh, in Africa, and say uh, British colonies in Africa and Asia. So these are empires that existed at that time. What happened to this? Um, so, so question then, often asked, why was world, what triggered the First World War? And what made it uh, uh, such a, uh, such a uh, drastic war, such a, uh, an amazing war, and came to be called World War? Now, yesterday in our one conversation, it says it was really not a world war in the sense it happened largely in Europe. But really, it, it happened in Europe, but it impacted in all parts of the world. And when I said to you that you had Australia sent soldiers, or our volunteers went from here to fight there, and same way, what, 1.3 million people from India went to fight there. So obviously, even though they were not fighting in India, but they were fighting on behalf of the empire somewhere else. And many of these people from India had never traveled out of the country and never seen other white people. Uh, and so uh, much is now being written about it. Their encounters, how do we know about it? And the letters they wrote, or some paintings they made, or sometimes stories they uh, wrote. So uh, this is the way we learn about culture and people's response to things. So what, was the, what were the various factors that created this war? So first was f uh, fervent nationalism. And nationalism. Now, it is one thing to love your country, but when you become fanatic about it, to the extent that my country alone is good, my country, we have to fight for it, and the other countries have to be crushed, that, it becomes, that kind of fanaticism is destructive. That kind of nationalism is not patriotism. It is a silly, destructive sentiment. It is the same way about religion. It is one thing to say, well, I am a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim. But when you set out to kill, destroy others' religions and people of others' religions, that is stupidity. That is fanaticism of the worst kind. So same way, this kind of nationalism was very much uh, rapidly spreading in many parts of Europe at that time. So then you have many unresolved previous disputes. Yesterday I mentioned in my talk that we human beings have a way of having certain emotions that fester on with us. We lose a war, we lose a fight, uh, the animals do, fight and flight, they run away. But we, sometimes when we run away, we don't really run away. We say, well, we run away for the time being. I'll get back to you one day, I'll get back to you. Now, this, some of these disputes, uh, particularly between France and Germany at that time, are crucial. In 1871, before, about uh, 40 years before the war started, Germany uh, had humiliated France greatly 
in the war in 1871, and it was in Versailles, where the treaty took place in 1919, that the other treaty took place in 1871, in which France was humiliated by Germany. And now remember, when finally things turn around, France wants to humiliate Germany. So you see how country, a people, politicians, and say, they harbor those feelings, a festering feeling. You did this to me, did to us. Now we're going to do it to you, not since you are down, uh, you are fall, uh, fallen down, and we'll do it to you. So this sense of revenge, or sense of uh, revenge, very, it has, uh, has had very uh, deep, uh, hist long history. And sometimes the revenge is on a personal scale, you uh, one to one, uh, between families. But now the revenge between nations. And so this revenge that, uh, between France, why I, I will uh, tell you uh, very briefly, uh, shortly, about how France was, a uh, role of France in the uh, 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 Treaty of Versailles. But uh, that goes back, many people don't uh, fully remember it, that it goes back to 1871, in which France was very hu much humiliated by Germany in, uh, in the war. So uh, those things uh, have continued. And then the arms race uh, of the previous decades. Now, we, we think of arms race, uh, 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 today's phenomenon, but arms race have been going on for, uh, for many, many, many decades and centuries. Say, so people, you have it, so we must have it. And so the, it continues. And, and we have discovered that technology is, is very crucial. What kind of weapons you have is very crucial in winning a war or losing a war. And so arms race became... Uh, very, has been in the making in that part of uh, Europe for quite some time, and that contributed to the war as well. I will show you um, uh, how, what kind of new weapons uh, were uh, developing. So you have um, also colonial rivalry. Now, some countries had uh, gone to many parts of the world. You had Holland and France and, and Spain and Portugal earlier, and then you had uh, Britain many parts of Europe and Africa, uh, sorry, Asia and Africa, and but some countries felt we are left out, and particularly the country that felt we didn't have any colonies. How come it's about time for us to have colonies? And the country that felt left out was Germany. Germany did not have colonies when the other empires, other uh, uh, countries in Europe were de developing their uh, empires. So here then there was a rivalry. How can we now get into parts of Africa? or some parts of uh, Asia, to, so we too have uh, colonies. So there was a rivalry. And as, as in rivalry, many times the rivalries are destructive. And this is exactly what happened at, at that time. Now, this was also industrial unrest. This is the time where industrial revolution was now becoming very, very much a fact of life in many parts of Europe. It started in, in England in the later part of the 18th century, but soon it was spreading to many other parts of, uh, of Europe. In Germany, big changes about industrialization. And then you have workers and the whole idea of capitalism. What should, how should the workers be treated? How much should they be given? Who owns what? And if somebody breaks a leg and, and job, then what kind, is there compensation? How can a person be fired away? What wages? These have been very crucial questions, and yet with the Industrial Revolution and in the earlier part of the 20th century, they become very vital questions. And so everywhere, the workers were rising. They were asking for fair deal, and they were questioning the, the whole idea of capitalism. Now, here I want to mention to you, some of you uh, have interest in history, that Britain produced two very remarkable thoughts in political history. One was capitalism, the idea of capital, free enterprise. And it, the father of free enterprise, or capitalism, was, uh, was Adam Smith. He was a professor of moral philosophy in Edinburgh. And he wrote this book called Wealth of Nations. And, uh, and it's a remarkable book. He was not looking only at capitalism as creating, uh, generating wealth, but he's seeing it in a larger moral context in which societies will have freedom to pursue uh, many things without the hindrance of the state, and, and so on. And so uh, that particular book, uh, um, uh, Wealth of Nations, written by Adam Smith uh, in later part of the 18th century, became the Bible of capitalism. It still is. I mean, if Adam Smith were to come back and say how capitalism had changed and what it had, the corporate capitalism and, and so on, he'll probably uh, stir in his grave. 
But it's certainly that is the book of uh, the Bible of capitalism uh, written in Britain, in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And then the second book, which many people don't know, that the Marx, Marx book, Das Kapital, was written in England. Marx spent the last half of his life in England. The, that's the only country that gave him shelter. He was originally from Germany, but he Germany uh, did not. Uh, he was uh, uh, exiled from Germany. He was uh, did not could not possibly survive his ideas. He was very much threatened. Then the second place he went to was France, but he too, then he was exiled from France as well. So he finally the place that would gave him shelter was uh, was England for Britain, and he spent the, la the second half of his life in Britain. Interesting, many people, um, and today, even today, there is a statue of him. The play, and many people who uh, 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 believe in Marxism very much uh, come and pay homage to him. And so there is a, even in the National Library of, uh, in London, uh, there is a chair. If you visit next time, there's a chair. And the chair says, Karl Marx used to sit here. And that's where he wrote his book, Das Kapital. So these two books... In a say, we, many times we think, well, ideas are work, a dime a dozen. That's not true. The ideas can move the world. And these two, certainly these two books, they have been very influential in saying, how do we conduct our lives, our economic life, political life, moral life, and, and so on. Now, uh, uh, just as a, an aside, I should say, um, in 1999, as the new millennium was ushering, there was a, uh, uh, there was a poll conducted by BBC. And it said, who is the most influential thinker of the last thousand years? Who is the most influential thinker of the last thousand years? And they conducted this poll across the world. And many people were surprised that they found the most influential thinker was Karl Marx. And so I bring this to you because these two ideas were now beginning to, beginning to take hold in the minds of many people in the industrialized countries, and Germany, and France, and Canada. Canada had its worker strike in 1919, uh, soon after the war was over, in this small little town called Winnipeg. It's not such a small town anymore, but at that time it was a sleepy little place. And they had a strike. And similar strikes were happening in San Francisco, in London, in Paris, in many cities of Germany. So there was unrest. The feeling was that capitalism has done them not, done them good. That only a few people have become very rich, but those who generate wealth were not being, get, getting a good deal. And so there was a fear that there could be a communist revolution in, not in Russia, but in Germany or in France. So these were very arrestive period in the, in our, in the history of Europe uh, in the, before the war started. Uh, these are important things to remember because uh, uh, what happened in Germany in the 1920s after, uh, uh, and what led to the Second World War, uh, all in a way quite sort of tied up together. Let's move on. So... I mentioned the social uh, unrest, uh, uh, German domestic politics and uh, uh, what happened in 12, and French, and income tax was introduced, and women's movement. This is also the time in England, suffrage movement, women uh, uh, struggling for the right to vote and equality, and, and this was going on right through the, sec uh, through the First World War. So there's a great deal of unrest on, on questioning of our society, societal structures at many levels. Uh, you know, women constitute half the world, but uh, how, uh, how uh, they have struggled to f uh, get a, a right of vote, um, firstly in England and then the United States and many other countries, and how long it took for them. And, and so this is a, uh, all this became a very important part of the, that particular period in history in, in Europe. Um, so, he, I mentioned to you that the importance of weaponry. In the First World War, uh, the number of people I just uh, shared with you, how many have done, 37 million people died in the war. And uh, because the new kinds of weaponry was being now devised. And many scientists, many technologists, engineers contributed to devising this. It was considered a patriotic duty. In fact, when Einstein, the great uh, scientist uh, uh, who uh, lived in uh, Switzerland, which was a, a neutral country in the First World War, when he moved from uh, Switzerland in 1916 to, uh, to Germany, um, he was very troubled 
He, he was a deeply, a man deeply committed to peace. And he was very troubled that so many of his colleagues, so many of other great scientists, so many of his friends, not only colleagues, but his friends, were contributing to making poisonous weapons of destruction. And he felt very troubled by it. And he questioned them that should we not, we who are men of the intellect and who are uh, the, uh, people who are doing so well in science and, and uh, many other areas of in, uh, inquiry, so should we be doing this? So many people contributed to making new weaponry. And firstly, it was the first, world, the first time in the human history that trench warfare was introduced and digging up and literally fighting like a rat. In fact, there were thousands of millions of rats all over in these trenches. And there are many uh, people now dig up photographs and people, uh, the letters people wrote home and what kind of miserable life they had. And then you have barbed wire. became a very important pep, uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the weaponry. Uh, it was introduced again for the first time in the First World War. And then you have submarines. Uh, uh, the whole history, now they seem like, oh, we have, you know, seem such a long time all these things were invented and used, but they, they was the first time uh, that in, in a war they were employed. And tanks, which changed the whole nature of cavalry. The horses, what is the importance of horses in war when the tanks come? And then the aerial warfare. Uh, last time, I, in one of my presentations to you, I shared with you that New York Times uh, in an editorial in 1912, just uh, uh, two, a year and a half before the war started, they said no civilized nation would think of using uh, aeroplanes to bombard another country. And it was only a year later, every civilized country, however we might define civil civilized country to be, every civilized country was involved in, in cultivating their uh, air force to attack others. So you see how moral values shifted around because a new kind of weaponry had now been devised. Just before the uh, 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 war started, there were alliances between different uh, countries, and they were very intricate alliances. Sometimes there were alliances, sometimes treaties, sometimes uh, deals were made, and sometimes people don't even, didn't even know what kind of alliances various countries had. What kind of alliances Austria-Hungary had with Italy, or with Germany, or Russia with France and Britain. So you see how intricate the European uh, uh, tangled relationships, very tangled relationships, to the extent the Americans always thought that the Europeans are just they're living in the, some way back in older times, and they did not wish to be involved in the American, in their European wars. Uh, in fact, in both wars, First World War and Second World War, America did not join till after two years of the war. And once it joined, of course, things turned around very rapidly. But it was the people of America and the politicians were very reluctant to get involved in the wars in Europe, largely because so many wars seemed so tangled and so uh, confusing. Who is with whom and why? Is it language that plays the role? Is it certain religion? Is it ethnicity or a certain kind of nationalism? What is it that makes these countries fight? In fact, in European history, in the last thousand years, until the end of the Second World War, in European history, you don't have a period of more than 50 years where there's been peace. This is the longest period in European history since, the, uh, since 1945 that there has been peace in Europe. And you know, we may think uh, of European Union, uh, you know, we make jokes, and as I shared with you, a joke about language. But really, this is the longest period in European history since 1945, except in Yugoslavia, there has not been a war. But until that time, for very, there hardly any period where there has been a, a more than 50 years there has been peace between countries. So these tangled relationships between countries that went on, and very destructive relationships. Now here I show you then who was on whose side. You see the, the, the greenery here, the green area, these are the allied forces. Russia was part of the allied forces, the, of, part of France and, uh, and um, uh, Britain. Um, uh, and of course we have USA and Canada sporting and from Australia and New Zealand and, and all the members of the British Empire are sporting. So all green areas are the, in a way sporting the allied forces. 
And what are the other areas? You see, oranges, you see, there are small parts of orange, but this is the, uh, the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Germ Germany, and then Turkey, Ottoman Empire joined them. So you find that uh, uh, the, uh, this is, uh, these are the two uh, sides, as it were. And then you have certain neutral areas, which did not really participate very much, part particularly in South America, and particularly in the western part of South America, countries like Chile um, and, and Peru. And, uh, but on the whole, it, be it is a world war in the sense it impacted uh, every country, and every country contributed to it in one way or the other. Um, now, let's uh, come to what happened after the war. Because here, um, suddenly there was a hope. There was a hope, a dream, particularly in the United States, particularly this man, the president of USA at that time, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I consider him one of the great men of the 20th century, a really a remarkable man, very unusual man. He was a professor. He was a prof and he was the president of the University of Princeton. And he was a son of a, a Presbyterian minister. So he was a very religious man and a very moral man. At, and he was quite imbued with this idea that it is possible to live morally, peacefully, nonviolently. And he carried this idea to, um, to, um, to France to, in the peace, peace treaty that started on the 1st of January, 1919. That's the beginning, very first of January, the beginning of the, and it went on, the peace treaty went on for the whole year, for long, one year long. And, uh, uh, and it's sort of first half of the, by the end of June, uh, largely many treaties were formulated, but that many smaller treaties continued to the end of the year. Now I want to say to you about Wilson a little more. He came from the United States, and this is the first time, first time in American history that an American president, a sitting American president, had traveled to Europe. Never traveled to Europe before. Can you imagine this today? It's the first time an American sitting American president traveled to Europe. And he traveled not by air. At that time, it was not quite possible to do that. But traveled by ship. And he took a whole entourage of people with him. And he had a plan, a 14-point plan, that how are we going to bring peace? And one of the things that he really emphasized, we are going to have a disarmament in the world. No more weapons in the world. Amazing. Today, America is the biggest seller of weapons in the world. Um, all members of the security councils, I call them uh, merchants of death. Uh, they, they all sell weapons. But at that time, Wilson went with this idea that we will have a world in which will be disarmament. There will be no more weapons or large weapons. So Wilson brings this at a time where, uh, firstly, uh, there are so many, uh, so few people uh, were um, uh, uh, interested in getting Wilson to be involved in a, a negotiating treaty. But when Wilson did, uh, when America did join the war, many soldiers in the American army were Germans, of German origin. Um, it's, uh, it's again because the uh, United States is a very different country from UK, from France, from Germany. It's a country of people who have come from all over the world, certainly now all over the world, but until the 19th century, until 1900, they came from Europe. And they came from Scandinavia, they came from Russia, they came from Italy and Germany. And so this is a country of immigrants in a way. And, and, um, the, uh, and the Statue of Liberty uh, uh, beckons people from all over the world in, in a manner. And so it's a country that has taken on its own dream, the American dream. And it doesn't matter where you came from, you take, took over the American dream of free enterprise, of movement, of freedom. So when, uh, when these soldiers were leaving, uh, American soldiers were leaving to come to fight in uh, Europe, uh, uh, I remember seeing a film in which uh, the president shakes a hand of soldiers and say, First, first of all, uh, you may be of German origin. Your father may be German, but first of all, you're an American. So you hear you're being sent to fight the Germans. So uh, this is a, uh, interesting how people now trying to see what is the nature of nationalism, idea of patriotism being taken a slightly different term. Now, I find um, Wilson, when he arrived, uh, uh, was given a hero's welcome. The people everywhere felt that here is a man who's bringing a new hope, a new hope to the world. And, and, and uh, 
mothers named their children after him streets were named schools were named he was nobody in the human history until that time it is said was given such a heroic welcome as wilson received in europe when he arrived and uh, there were disappointments that built on later on but certainly in the first uh, uh, several uh, months he arrived in december several months of his uh, presence there he was welcomed that he is a messiah he's going to bring about change now people have lived with a sense of hope for a long time that there is always hope that without hope, we can't live without hope um, uh, in dante's uh, famous book in uh, he writes the inferno what is an inferno abandon all hope we who enter here so we live with hope and it is with this hope and dreams that the europe uh, at that time in 1919 was beginning to feel that perhaps a new world can be created so who were the four people who were were the uh, the most important members of the uh, among us the peacemakers well you had uh, uh, president wilson of course but also a uh, 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 prime minister of england uh, lloyd george now lloyd george was a, a minister a labor of the labor party and he was a, a remarkably uh, he was a leftist a so- semi socialist and uh, and he was very aware of the social and political and industrial unrest that was building up in england england was a, a very active uh, uh, political presence at that time and he is also interestingly first person in uh, british history whose first language is not english he was a welsh his first language was welsh and uh, uh, but a, a man who uh, Uh, very uh, much admired in many ways uh, and a, a, a very pragmatic man and then you have a, a, pr- pr- a prime minister of france uh, georges clemenceau um, who was a, uh, a, a who was the oldest of all these four people he was 76 years of age when this negotiation started very angry man and uh, uh, i say this because we sometimes we look at our politicians decision makers as though they are just robots no they are human beings they bring a lot of their own thinking and ideas what how they were brought up what is their idea of morality what should happen or what should not happen and how they relate with each other a lot of people now are writing that the emotional intelligence how important it is in among us in among and politicians how important its role, what important role it plays in relating to each other do you make good rapport because here your people deciding the fate of the world how well do they relate to each other some of them didn't relate very well to each other and particularly the prime minister of france um, uh, um, georges clemenceau uh, many uh, people have written that they, they at time people used to keep diaries and so these diaries are now being published have been published and say well did what did wilson write about this man george say you deal with them every day do you find them troublesome a pain in the some part of the body or the other and how do you deal with them and uh, so and very important very interesting the relationship that people build in order to make important decisions and then uh, the fourth person not as important not and then uh, nearly as important as uh, the prime minister of italy so these are the four it is called the big four but uh, it didn't uh, finish there because there were other people coming in as i said everyone in the world was placing their hope that here in paris in in 1919 they will redesign the world they will restructure the world and uh, uh, and here on the right side you see a picture of lawrence of arabia yeah, I, as uh, uh, as uh, a turkish empire or, or ottoman empire was collapsing had collapsed after the war so what would happen to countries like saudi arabia to places like syria to iraq and lebanon and then who takes them uh, uh, who, what kind of because this is also the time oil oil was being discovered no oil has placed uh, oil has not uh, been discovered for it was only a 150 years old discovery started in 1850 but it is it, the role it has played in 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 the politics in the world has been remarkable and crucial and sometimes uh, destructive and it is the time now they're discovering some geologists is discovering so some of these countries iraq saudi arabia they may be sitting on huge wells of oil so who controls them after the uh, the collapse of the ottoman empire became a very vital question as we see its impact as Uh, recently as the war in iraq uh, because iraq had so much oil 
and Saudi Arabia has so much oil, and so does Iran. So how much the Middle East was now becoming uh, important in a manner it had never been before. It's important, and the, who knew about these things? Mostly uh, imperial countries, um, European countries, because they had the technology to find where the oil is. Iraq didn't have technology. Saudi Arabia did not have engineers or geologists to find out uh, where is the oil. It is the European technologists and engineers who say, ha, ah, we know where, where the oil might be, and how do we find it? How do we refine it? How do we take it away to, to, uh, for its use in other parts of the world? And indeed, its impact, as we know, in every walk of life it continues to be colossal. So that's why I say this, that uh, the big four and others uh, and, and here, the presence of people from uh, the Middle East. Now, here is a, a map of what it, the world looked like before uh, uh, who was what um, uh, happened. Uh, many new countries, which were sort of lying dormant. Countries like Poland and uh, Yugoslavia uh, in Europe, being redefined, Czechoslovakia, because earlier, uh, who, uh, the ethnicity was very important. Language has been very important. What defines Germany? What defines Czechoslovakia? Now Czechoslovakia has two countries. You have Slovak and, and Czech Republic, and because it is divided. And we've seen the war in Yugoslavia, how it has been splintered in so many new countries. But these were also in the making at that time. And, and distrust. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and who rules, and what manner you, you, you uh, rule. Now, remember at that time, there was no such thing as human rights, the idea of equality, that everyone who is a member of your state or government or country is to be treated equally. Now, we fight over it. We feel, well, if it doesn't matter if I'm black or brown or yellow or white. If I'm a citizen of uh, Australia or Canada, I should be treated equally. This idea of equality didn't quite exist at that time. And, and certainly Woodrow Wilson, when he arrived, he was very much promoting that idea, even though in his own country there were a lot of black people who were not being treated equally. So these are sort of ironies uh, of um, uh, politics in many ways. But these are the uh, things that um, uh, tells you in map. And after the war, uh, as I said, new countries emerged. And, and all this was part of the treaty that, that was taking place. I quickly go over it because there are many other things to discuss. So as I said, everyone is now knocking. Uh, as everyone is knocking on the um, doors of um, these leaders, they were hoping that these leaders now will bring a change to um, a thing that have been otherwise been ignored uh, by um, their own people, their own politicians for a long time. Um, uh, here, China belongs to the Chinese, became a very... Because here, Japan had its own imperial uh, excursions uh, in many uh, Asian countries. And Japan had very imperial designs on uh, Asian, uh, many Asian uh, countries. Uh, Japan very much envious of European nations, particularly Britain, thinking that r the true uh, imperial power that should rule uh, Asia should not be European, it should be an Asian uh, imperial power, and, and that was Japan. So Japan wanted to see how they can rule India, and Philippines, and uh, Malaysia, uh, and so on. Why is it a country, small country from, uh, from Europe, should be ruling uh, countries in Asia, such huge countries like India in Asia? So there was a, this idea uh, the emerging, who is, uh, uh, is China certainly very afraid of uh, 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 Japan at the time. So asserting how China's nationalism, China's interests, China's boundaries, China's uh, uh, interests can be uh, preserved. And same, po Poland must live again. And then Kurdistan, uh, I mentioned the other day how there are Kurds living in three countries, in Iran and Turkey and Iraq. Uh, and so they are asserting their nationalism, their freedom. And then people complained, endless complaints. And they didn't know where to turn for complaints. So everybody's now coming to Paris with their complaints, hoping that these four people, these four big four, will uh, listen to them and make some uh, decisions uh, that can help them resolve the conflict. So you have Slovaks against Czechs, and Chinese against the Japanese, and Croats against Serbs, and Arabs against Jews. Now, just quickly, uh, let me uh, tell you that this is the, the birth of Israel. 
The birth of Israel goes to the collapse of Ottoman Empire because now Palestine became part of the British pro protectorate. And then this is the first time the Zionist movement is being given a promise that a new homeland for the Jews will be, will be granted. And, and it is a movement like this starting uh, in USA and uh, promises being made. And indeed, as we know, the birth of Israel took place in 1948. But its roots of that birth go back to the collapse of the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, in the First World War. This is also the beginning of the uh, creation of a, a Republic of uh, Ireland. Uh, Ireland was divided in two parts and uh, Irish people uh, fighting against the British uh, uh, colonialism, if you like, and, and they promised to fight in the war on, on part of the British Empire on the, uh, um, on the hope that they will be given guaranteed uh, uh, republic. And indeed, in 1922, the beginning of the creation of the Republic of Ireland took place many years later, but that is where it started. And then the third thing, very important thing, is the liberation of women and women's rights. So you have women's rights and the Irish movement and the rights of homeland for the Jewish. So all these three things are very, uh, very crucial. We see their impact uh, in our life today, 100 years later, or 75 years later. <clears throat> um, now, when, um, 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 League of Nations was uh, the other idea that Woodrow Wilson brought to, from the United States. This is his idea. Just as we have a police in a, in a city, or we have military in a country, or police forces. So the idea that you do not take law in your own hand. This is a great step in human civilization. This idea that revenge is not civilized behavior. I hurt you does not mean you hurt me back. No, I go to police and complain. And so the police investigates, and there are supposedly judges who then find out who is guilty and who is to be punished. So this whole idea, very important idea, that you do not take law in your own hand. Until thousands of, for thousands of years, people had no idea that there's a law and that people, you did wrong to me, so I'll do wrong to you. An eye for eye, and a grave for a grave on the other side. So this idea now, say, how is it possible to do it on a global level? Countries fight because there is no police to control the two countries. So this is how, how the idea of uh, League of Nations uh, started. And it was brought by, um, by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, now, for, it, d it didn't quite work out, unfortunately, because it takes a long time before an idea can become a reality and to iron out all the difficulties. But certainly it, it uh, germinated. Should, it be, should the role be uh, of a clergyman or a policeman? A clergyman tells you, you confess, you go and confess, you do say, I punish you, do your rosary. But a policeman uh, is a different approach. So this idea of what is the role of a uh, League of Nations, how could it work? And, um, and then uh, again and again, Woodrow Wilson, with, and this idea of uh, optimism, that it is not, we, can, we, we, don't, we don't let the opportunity go by. Or the, he used to say the age of miracle is not over. It can happen. It can happen that we can uh, start... Uh, uh, work living with each other differently. And, uh, and this war was called the end of uh, wars that to end all wars. And so there was a kind of hope that uh, was very much part of, the, uh, of this treaty or uh, this peace conference that was going on uh, in France, in Paris at that time. Um, and then, of course, there are always people, and will continue to be. Always people say, well, life is to be looked at through politic, uh, for uh, a realistic, pragmatic, practical way, and this is not how people are. Uh, and then there are others who are idealists, who look at it with a certain degree of idealism. So I think, in a way, there is a co always a combination. Sometimes one takes over, the other takes place. But this conference, certainly in Paris in 1919, was very uh, deeply touched by the concept of the idea of idealism, which was not shared by, certainly not by France. Certainly not by the Prime Minister of France, who thought that Wilson is a crazy man. He's just a, uh, he says, uh, uh, God brought only 12 uh, principles of, uh, you know, and here he comes with 14. Um, and uh, so there was a the sense that he's just too impractical, that he does not understand the real politics of things. Um, but uh, 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 this is uh, certainly happening at the time. So let me quickly show you what were the uh, 14 points of, uh, that Wilson brought, because they are um, 
very important. As open covenants of peace, freedom of navigation, removal of economic barriers, armaments reduced to minimum, adjustment of colonial claims, letting Russia decide its destiny, self-determination, independence, so many things. And I mean, he didn't even understand what is self-determination mean in a world where there are so many colonies. And people said he's very unpractical. He's not really rooted to understand the politics of things. Now, this is the period during the war Again, I need to remind you of history. This is the period during the war that the Russian Revolution started in 1916, 1917, yeah, and, and it erupted. And many of these countries, the big four, didn't know how to respond to it. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Because certainly the people who ruled Russia at that time were terribly decadent, uncaring of their people, and had great differences between the lives of people. So the Russian Revolution took that place during that period. Armenian genocide took that place. Wars had gone on for four years. So the, what Wilson brought uh, uh, to the table, as it were, uh, really a quite uh, amazing new things. Um, new hopes uh, um, being built about imperial Germany now, no longer an imperial, because they felt that this Germany has been an aggressive country for, so long, uh, for a long time. The only way to deal with it would be to uh, curtail it, and, um, uh, and so on. I got to, our time is running out, so I've got to uh, go quickly here. Uh, the human rights I mentioned already, uh, uh, the war to end all wars, Bolshevik revolution that st started, and then um, I mentioned about. So here then, when the, the treaty, the Versailles, Treaty of Versailles, how was Germany to be handled? How Germany is to be treated? Well, a lot of Germans were very angered by it. They felt here is a Lady Germania chained to the torture pole, and many uh, paintings and, and cartoons uh, dec uh, decrying that the treaty was absolutely unfair and destructive, and, and, and uh, indeed it was exploited later on by Hitler, uh, uh, touching their sentiment, uh, uh, nationalistic sentiment. So you have uh, the Treaty of Versailles uh, has been, uh, many people still continue to visit. Is it, it laid the roots for the Second World War? Is it what created Hitler and Nazism? And what led to it? Was it fair or unfair? To what degree was it fair or not fair? But certainly there are a lot of forces saying, how can now uh, Germany be controlled forever? Um, and what parts of Germany should we take, go, go to Poland or go to France? What sources, some of its coal mines taken over by uh, France? So many, many things are now being decided and its colonies of, in, uh, uh, in Africa. Who should rule them? Its colonies in the Pacific. Uh, and, and so they're really taking over uh, many parts of uh, Germany to di divide it up among us themselves. No, we'll have to move fast here because the time has run out. A treaty of Versailles really uh, allowed a total of 4,000 officers only and, not to, and Germany not to take part in the League of Nations. Germany has to deliver certain amounts of coal and, and Germany has to pay 20 billion of coal. So all this was part of the, of the treaty. It created a sense of humiliation in Germany. Humiliation. And certainly those are national people. Uh, Hitler is a great example, how he used it and, and felt angered by it and re increased the sentiment of his people, how uh, uh, it, it has really humiliated. Germany was the strongest country at the time uh, in Europe and how it felt humiliated and how it can get back. Indeed, it got back 20 years later in 1939. Um, and the Turkey, too, was uh, uh, seized all foreign possessions. That's how Syria was created. That's how Iraq was created. And Lebanon became a part of, uh, as a French colony. Um, so um, the, the question then, I'll conclude here, um, being asked uh, that uh, is the human nature, uh, is violence in human nature? Steven Pinker, a, a psychologist at Harvard University, wrote a book about a couple of years ago called The Better Angels of Our Nature. He says that violence is actually going down in the human history. Uh, or he's taken a period of 200,000 years, not just the uh, last 20,000 or last 2,000 years, but a period of 200,000 years, how human beings are becoming more civilized, less given to violence, despite all the violence that we have seen in the 20th century, still continue to see. A remarkable book called uh, 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 the, uh, the Decline of Vi in Violence, uh, uh, in human so uh, societies. So I leave this question here. Is violence or is it love in our genes or is it violence? And uh, question, it's, not a, it's not a simple question. And uh, as I said earlier, everyone who uh, reflects on the human condition is asking this question. So many anthropologists and psychologists and biologists 
and, uh, and politicians and writers and novelists and literature people asking this question. Where is it? How is it? Why is it? And it's a question that goes back uh, not only to 1919, as I shared with you, goes back to the time of Greek plays 23, 2400 years ago. It comes, it has a question that has plagued us, not plagued us, but continues to stir us our imagination time and again. And it's a vital question. So thank you very much.